Fed up with the everyday grind? Tired out from the summer heat? Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape. Escape. Designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are trapped in a remote valley in the Andes, walled in by sheer rock precipices. And surrounding you, closing in on you, is a band of blind men who want your eyes. Tonight, we escape to the mountains of Ecuador and to a remarkable world where sight is unknown, as H.G. Wells imagined it in his gripping story, The Country of the Blind. My name is Ibarra. I'm a mining engineer in Quito, Ecuador, high in the towering Andes. Up until a year ago, my chief sport was mountain climbing. My last climb was an attempt to scale the remote and forbidding peak of Paris Cotapetl, a 20,000-foot crag unconquered by man. It is unconquered still. 3,000 feet from the icy summit, we turned back and fled for our lives. All of us escaped, except one a guide named Nunez, who slipped over the frightful precipice and disappeared in the vast chasm, yawning 10,000 feet beneath us. The horror of that man's fall has terrorized my dreams for a year. Because of it, I've forsaken mountain climbing for the rest of my life. And that decision still stands, even though today... I have seen Nunez. He was sitting on the steps at my shack when I arrived at the mine this morning. At first, I I didn't recognize him. He was so much changed. I thought he was some weird, ragged beggar. Is it you, Senor Ibarra? My name is Ibarra, yes. What do you want? You do not know me, Senor. No? Well, you look like a man I knew once, but he... He's... He is dead. Dead on the slopes of Periscotopetl. Nunez. Oh, no, it couldn't be. Nunez, that is my name, senor. At least that is the name I remember. But you... you fell. I saw you fall. Yes. But it, it, it's impossible that you could have lived. Perhaps the gods of the mountain had some reason to spare me. Nunez, if we had... if we'd had any idea that you were alive, but... you went down thousands... thousands of feet. We couldn't even attempt to find your body. I know, I know. I do not blame you. You could not have reached me, and if you had, I should not have welcomed you at first. But then, later... Yes, what do you mean? Senor, you will not believe what I have to tell. I can hardly believe that I'm seeing you, Nunez, and talking to you. You remember that night, the night I fell? Yes, of course. We had been toiling all day inching our way up a steep ice wall, and as darkness came, we found a narrow ledge, barely three feet wide. It's not very wide, but uh, we can get our shelter wall up, cut off some of this wind. Well, that will be welcome. Yes, Yes. but first we'll rest a moment. Oh, look at that icy devil up there, glistening in the moonlight. Yes. There's another 3,000 feet of sheer ice wall. We'll have to cut our own holes from now on. Won't even be ledges like this for resting places. Well, I can see why no one's ever made it. <laughs> do you think we should go on? I don't know. Nunes, what do you think? It is not my place to say, senor. I was hired to go to the top. I agreed. But what do you really think? If I believed in the gods of the mountain as the Indians do, I, I should be frightened now. Why? Because we have invaded the Forbidden Circle. This part of the Andes is unmapped and almost unknown, senor. It is an easy thing to believe strange things in this white loneliness. Some of the legends are fascinating. I've heard of one, something about a 
A hidden valley called the country of the blind. Yes. See? It is supposed to be somewhere down there, below us. A fertile valley which was settled many centuries ago and then cut off by the great landslide of Araka. Yes, but why the country of the blind? Even before it was cut off, the people developed a strange illness. All of them slowly went blind, and after that their children were born blind. The legend is that the valley was the home of the mountain gods. It was too beautiful for human eyes. It's odd. But then, of course, it's all nonsense. Yes. Yes, of course. It would be pleasant to find it, though. You know the old proverb, in the country of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. I doubt if we should ever find it. I even doubt if it exists. Of course not. I was only joking. Mm. Yes. Now, if you're rested, we'll make the shelter wall. Right, huh? Excellent. I'll give you a hand in a moment. Believe me, Ibarra, for two pesos, I'd give up this climb. I never realized... Senors! Senors, I'm slipping! I fell perhaps a thousand feet, and then I felt the heavy stinging impact of snow. I'd fallen onto an almost perpendicular slope, and once again I was sliding down, down, tumbling over and over. But now, under me, around me, over me, an immense avalanche of snow was rumbling, sliding with me. Suddenly I realized that my own motion had almost stopped and it was the snow that was moving. I was riding the avalanche. And at almost the same moment I went over the second precipice. It was higher than the first, much higher, perhaps 4,000 feet. I, I fell with the snow for what seemed minutes every second expecting the terrible final impact. But the impact never came. Miracle of miracles, that sheer wall blended almost imperceptibly into another steep slope, and again I was sliding. And gradually, as the arc of the slope curved away, I felt myself slow down. I was whirled along on top of the avalanche, and then, as it subsided out onto the gentler snow upon a gentler slope. And finally, I rolled to a stop and lay still. When I awoke, it was morning, and I was covered with snow. I shook off the cold, white blanket rolled over on my back and looked up. My heart almost stopped as I saw from where I'd fallen. The mountain towered eight, ten thousand feet above me. Carefully, I felt myself. My clothes were torn. I was bruised and bleeding. I ached in every muscle, but... I had not a single broken bone. I lay there and offered up a prayer to the gods of the mountain. Far below me lay a lush valley sparkling in the morning sunlight. I could see the stately trees and green meadows fresh with dew. I started down, but it was still an arduous descent. The farther down I got, the more I realized the beauty of the scene. Why, this was a hidden paradise I'd fallen into. And I was the first man ever to see it. So I thought. But I was wrong. I realized that first when I saw the cultivation in the meadows, and then the walks. Well-kept stone walks laid in a symmetrical pattern all over the valley. And then I saw them. There were men and women lying under the trees, resting. Nearby, a collection of windowless huts marked a village, and the plastering of the houses was done in a wild variety of colors. I thought to myself, <laughs> the plasterer who did that must have been blind as a bat. <laughs> then I saw the two men who were quite close to me. They were standing on a bridge over the little stream. They were dressed in odd, loose clothing, and there was a strange look about their faces. They failed to notice me as I approached until I shouted, and suddenly they looked up attentively in my direction. I waved wildly at them, but they took no notice. Why, the fools must be blind. Blind? Could it be I'd fallen into the legendary country of the blind? In the country of the blind, a one-eyed man is king. Hello there. It is a man, or a spirit, come down from the rocks. Oh, uh, I'm a man, all right, just like you, but I've had a miraculous escape, and now I find myself here in your valley. Valley? Valley? Come hither. 
Let me feel of you. Certainly, here, my my arm and my face. You yeah. see, I'm indeed a man like yourself. My my lips move with yeah. speech. You feel... Oh, oh careful there. <laughs> Gently on, on the eyes. Eyes? Eyes? That is strange. Feel this, Correa. Yes, I feel. Careful. You, you feel the eyelids flutter? He is but imperfectly formed. Some strange bulge there. Unseemly. No, no, your eyes are shrunken in, but mine are whole, I can see. See? See? Pedro, he's a strange wild one. Where does he come from? Down out of the rock. No, from over the mountains, out of the country beyond there, where, where men can see. From Bogota, where there are a hundred thousand people, and the city stretches out of sight. It... Sight? What strange words he uses, without meaning. And, and feel the coarseness of his hair. Like a llamas. Ooh. And you have come into the world. Into? What? No, out of the world. The big world beyond the mountains. The, the world that stretches 12 days' journey to the sea. Our fathers have told us men may be made by forces of nature. It is the warmth of things and moisture and rottenness. Let us lead him to the elders. You don't have to lead me. I can see. See? Yes, of course. I... <coughs> I, I didn't see your water bucket. His senses are still imperfect. He stumbles and talks meaningless words. Lead him by the hand. But look, I... I... <laughs> oh, well, all right. These people had been blind for centuries. They'd forgotten even the words associated with seeing, and they thought I was an idiot, only half-formed especially when they led me into the pitch blackness of one of their windowless huts and I stumbled over someone else. Oh, oh. oh, a thousand pardons, Medina Sorote. He is a clumsy one. I'm sorry. I, I fell down. I couldn't see in the darkness. Who is this? And what is he saying? He is but newly formed. He has come down from the rocks. He stumbles as he walks and mingles words that mean nothing with his speech. He is a wild man out of the rocks. No, I come from Bogota, over the mountains. You hear? Bogota. He uses wild words. His mind is hardly formed. He has only the beginnings of speech. Bogota. <laughs> yes. I come from the great world where men have eyes and see. That must be his name, Bogota. He stumbled twice as we came thither. He must be taught. No, no. Don't you understand? I can see, but not in the dark. To you, darkness or light is all the same. But to me, to, to us outside in the world beyond the mountains... Mountains? We... What are mountains? Oh, very well, then. Beyond the rocks. There is nothing beyond the rocks. That is the end of the world. But surely you must realize the sky above covers sky more than this above, valley. There is nothing above but the roof of rock. He is very raw, my children. He shall have to be taught from the beginnings. Take him away. Feed him. But guide him. See that he does not stumble over my daughter again. Do not fear, Father. I shall guide him myself. And feed him. Very well. Come, take my hand. Thank you. It'll it'll be a pleasure to get outside again, out of out of this darkness. Come this way. Yes. Uh, what is your name? Medina Sarote. Medina Sarote. Uh, mine is Juan Juan Nunez, and oh oh sunlight. Oh, this is better. And now it. Uh, Senorita, you're beautiful. I cannot tell what a wonderful thing you are to see. Oh, please, I'm afraid for you. Afraid? Yes, if you do not learn quickly and cease speaking such strange words, they may not be so kind to you. They might be angry. They might even destroy you. This thought had not occurred to me before, and suddenly I had a twinge of fear. Still the proverb kept running through my mind. In the country of the blind, a one-eyed man is king. But try as I would, I could not make them understand my wonderful gift of sight. They simply could not comprehend it. Worse, they were not impressed. They, they thought me stupid and untaught, almost an idiot. Day by day I, I learned their peaceful ways, but they could not learn mine. It was getting on my nerves, and there's two, perhaps. Bogota. Bogota, come hither. 
Bogota, you move not. No, and I won't, you old beetle. I'll show you. I'll leave the path and... Bogota, trample not on the grass. It's not allowed. I... How did you know I stepped on the grass? I heard, of course. Heard, but I didn't make a sound. Why do you not come when I call you? Can you not hear the path as you walk? I can see it. There is no such word as see. Cease this folly. Follow the sound of my feet. Oh, my time will come. You will learn. There is much to learn in the world. Has no one ever told you in the country of the blind the one-eyed man is king? Blind? What is blind? Oh, never mind. Go on. Bogota, I must warn you. Just keep quiet and learn. And stop this nonsense about seeing. Nonsense, is it? I'll show you. I've taken enough of your insults. Unformed mind got no sense. I'll be king here. I can see and I'll be king. Bogota, stop it. No, I'm through with your orders. I'll show you what an advantage sight can be. I can hit you, hurt you. And you can't see me to strike back. Bogota, put down that spade. You devil, your ears are sharp, aren't they? But it won't do you any good now. I'll show you. I'll strike. I'll... No, no, I can't do it. I cannot hit a blind man. Bogota, pick up that spade. Do not leave it lying on the walk. Someone might stumble. Pick it up yourself. Do as I say. Take your hands off me. Take them off. Bogota! Bogota! Stop! I finally lost my temper and shoved him over and ran. The next half hour was a nightmare. Before I reached the fields, they were following me, 20 or more of them, armed with sticks and spades fanning out across the meadows, following my trail like bloodhounds. At first, I, I wanted to laugh, but... On they came, swift, inexorable, and the laugh froze in my throat. They didn't need eyes. They, they could smell me, feel my trail. On they came, closer and closer, encircling me, closing in. Bogota! Bogota, there must be no violence. You must come peacefully. By heaven, I'll hit you if you come any closer. I swear I will. Bogota! You don't understand. You, you are blind. I can see. I can see. Grab him. I'll hurt you. I swear I will. Leave me alone! I hit his arm, turned and ran over the wall outside the valley, back to the rocks, to the precipitous cliff I'd come down. But when I reached that sheer rock wall, I knew there was no place to go. For two days and nights, I stayed outside the valley, hungry and cold, and then I, I realized the hopelessness of my position. I was trapped. I must spend the rest of my life here. There was no way out. So I went back. I confess I was mad. I, uh, I admit I was only newly formed. That is better. And do you still think you can see? No. No, that was folly. The word means nothing. Less than nothing. And what means overhead? Rock is the overhead. There is a roof above the world, a roof of rock and very smooth. Very well. Now... Before you ask me any more, please, give me food or I shall die. Very well. Give him food. I shall. And after that, give him the most menial tasks in the village. Guard him well and perhaps... perhaps he shall learn yet. Thank you. Thank you. That is better. You are kind, Medina Sirote. Very kind. I am glad you came back. You are? If they were all like you, I should never have run away. What was that word you said I was? Beautiful. It means something nice. Oh, something very nice. Medina Sirote, why is it you have no husband? I... I have a disfigurement. These long hairs. Your eyelashes. Oh, but they're beautiful. They're considered a disfigurement. Oh, you're the most lovely girl in the valley, but they wouldn't know, would they? And so you have no lover. No. Medina Sorote, what do you think of me? Do you think of me as an idiot like all the no, rest? No, no. Oh, you have much to learn, but 
You will learn it, I'm sure. And you are kind and gentle. And your voice is soft. You speak the words that are soft and warm. No one has ever spoken such words to me. Then I shall speak them often, Medina Sarote. You are the only one in this valley, in this world that I care for. And so it began. I, the village idiot, the slave boy who dreamed to be king, I, with my eyes still whole, fell in love with Medina Sarote, the daughter of the elder of the village. Only to her could I open my heart without fear, and only to her could I speak of the beauty I could see around me. It is a beautiful valley, green with grass and yellow with sunlight and flowers, bright flowers dotting the hills. And in the cool of night, the stars gleam like diamonds in the sky. Oh, the words sound lovely. But what are stars? Stars? Why, they, they are... But, no. No, you wouldn't understand. And what do you mean, in the cool of the night? You still get that confused one. The night is warm, the day is cool. No, no, it is you here who have them backwards. Because the darkness means nothing to you. You work in the cool of night and sleep in the heat of day. <laughs> you and... are teasing me. Oh, no, no. I, I, I'm... Oh, what does it matter? All that matters is you. You here beside me. Martina Sirote, I love you. And I love you. I, I know they still think me an idiot, but you listen to what I say, and you don't think me an idiot, do you? No. No, I like to hear you speak. Then will you... Would you marry me? I would be very happy. No, I will not have it. But, Father... He's an idiot. He has delusions. He cannot do anything right. But he's getting better. He's better than he was. And he is strong and kind. Stronger and kinder than anyone in the world. And he loves me. And I love him. No, I will not have it. Uh, great sire, if you please. Yes? What is it, good doctor? I have examined Bogota, and the case is clear to me. I think very probably he might be cured. Uh -huh. And how might that be done? His brain is affected by something. I believe I know what it is. Those queer things he calls eyes. Where we have but an agreeable depression, he has great lumps. Consequently, his brain is in a constant state of irritation. But what can be done to cure him? Oh, it's a very simple surgical operation. Remove the cause of the irritation. We will merely cut out his eyes. <laughs> But they say it will make you well. But you don't understand, Medina Sarote. My world is sight. You would not want me to lose my most valued possession. I do not know. There are so many beautiful things to see. The, the flowers, the far sky with its drifting clouds, the sunset, the stars, you. Why, just to see you, it is good to have sight. And I would never see you again. I wish sometimes you would not talk like that. Like what? I know it. It's your imagination. I love it. But now... Now? You want me to... to... Oh, Medina Sirote. If I were to consent to this... Oh, if you would. If only you would. What else can I do? Oh, my dearest one. My dearest with a tender voice. I will repay you. Oh, Medina. Be brave. Carry my voice in your thoughts. Now I must go. And tomorrow... Yes? Tomorrow will be forever. Goodbye. Goodbye, Medina. Mm. 
I suppose I knew it then when I said that. I only meant to go up on the rocks and look out over the valley to spend my last day feasting my eyes on the wonderful, beautiful world of light and color. But when I got there, it was too beautiful, too lovely, this valley, this home of the mountain gods. Beautiful and forbidden. I drank it in, the green of the fields, the blue of the gently curving stream, the orange of the lichen in the rocky crevices. I climbed higher to see the great snow-capped peaks towering above and away to the distant sky, and higher still as the shadows turned the snow to purple and crimson and deep blue. The valley was far below now, and as beautiful as a painting. But like a painting, it looked unreal. Medina Sarote was small and far away, a distant dream. And the world of sight was here, all around me, overpowering, wonderful. I turned and began to climb up that sheer rock wall. <laughs> How many months it took me to make my way out over those mountains, over glaciers and snowfields and sheer precipices, I cannot guess. How I lived through the cold and hunger of it, I cannot tell you. But I'm here at last, back from the country of the blind. Good heavens, man. What an experience. Terrible and wonderful. But you, you aren't sorry you came back. Sorry? I see her face clearly now. <laughs> it is the only thing I see. Nunez, come, you need food. Here, take my hand. Thank you. Where is it, Senor Ibar? Nunez, you are? Yes. The god of the mountains has had this revenge. Those months of crawling over the snow and ice with the sun glaring down. Yes, I am blind. Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and tonight brought you The Country of the Blind by H.G. Wells. Adapted for radio by John Dunkel and featuring Paul Fries as Nunez, Barry Kroger as Ibarra, and Peggy Weber as Medina Sorote, with Wilms Herbert as Correa and Byron Kane as Pedro. Music was conceived by Cy Fuhr with Ivan Dittmars at the organ. Next week... You are spurring a lathered horse through the darkened streets, trapped between two hostile armies with a bit of magic in your pocket, and the American Revolution in the balance. Next week, we escape with Stephen Vincent Benet's delightful fantasy, A Tooth for Paul Revere. Good night, then, until this same time next week when once again we offer you Escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>